Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Polk of the Current Consulting Group. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar presentation, What Every Employer Should Know About COVID-19 Testing. I'd like to thank Orisha for hosting today's webinar. Orisha Technologies is a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. The unique assays provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to help determine the presence or absence of drugs of, or alcohol in a person's system. The Intercept Oral Fluid Drug Test is an FDA-cleared laboratory-based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for nine drugs of abuse, including marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, methadone, and opiates. Intercept is fast and easy to administer and is ideal for workplace, criminal justice, drug treatment centers, clinical setting screening programs, and more. Today's presentation will be presented by Jackie Perrone from Orisher Technologies and Bill Current from the Current Consulting Group. Jackie is the program leader for Orisher Technologies Risk Assessment Division, and she's responsible for the global direction as well as the financial and market growth of the drugs of abuse and risk assessment product lines. Bill is the founder of the founder and president of the current consulting group with 30 years of experience. He's authored 10 books on substance abuse issues, and he is a regular presenter at conferences, seminars, workshops, and webinars, and is widely considered one of the leading experts on drug testing and the drug testing industry. And so to start us out today, we're going to turn the virtual microphone over to Jackie. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, and welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon or this morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, so the presentation today is going to go through a, a number of sections, uh, all really related to, to COVID testing, especially in the workplace. Um, so first, we're going to talk about COVID-19 testing methodologies. Uh, then we'll kind of work into testing specimens. Uh, we'll talk about best practices for sample collection. Um, and then if you decide that uh, COVID testing is something that you'd like to start thinking about, um, we're going to tell you how to get started. And then we'll also end today with the CDC safe practice guidance. Um, so with that, we're going to start um, with COVID testing methodologies. Um, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to kind of talk just briefly about before we start getting into the actual types of tests is about coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, um, they're all, in, in many cases, you'll hear one versus the other, sometimes all three. Um, so I wanted to just back up a little bit and talk a little bit about the science. So coronaviruses are actually a large family of viruses that are common in people and sometimes in different species of animals. Um, rarely, um, some of those animal coronaviruses can infect people and then spread uh, can infect um, animals and then spread between people, as we've seen with MERS and SARS a couple of years ago. Um, so SARS-CoV-2, it's kind of our new, what they're calling novel coronavirus, and that's responsible for the current pandemic. We also call it COVID-19. Um, and if you're not familiar with how COVID-19 came to be, um, 19 signifies 2019. Um, so the first cases were actually seen in Wuhan, China, back in December of 2019. Um, although, as they've gone back and kind of done some tracing, they have actually found this particular virus in other places a little bit earlier than that, but still in 2019. So that's the, the kind of the term COVID-19, where it came from. Um, so now when you think about different types of tests that are out there, um, so you hear people talk about viral testing, and antibody testing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about each one of those. So there's actually two types of viral testing. Um, there's something called PCR and there's antigen testing. So PCR actually is a short-term short name for something called RT-PCR, which is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. So that's a very long word, a couple of words to say. Um, so you'll hear people just usually refer to it as PCR. Sometimes you'll hear them say RT-PCR um, and sometimes PCR. Um, this is a laboratory technique. Um, so this is not a point of care product it's, it, or test. It's actually a laboratory technique. Um, and it's really looking for the virus RNA. Um, and it looks for pieces of the SARS-CoV-2 or the, the COVID-19 virus. 
Um, and typically you'll find that in the nose, in the throat, and also other areas of the respiratory tract. This is really to see if somebody has a current infection. Um, also looking for current infection um, is antigen testing. It's a little bit different than PCR um, because it looks, rather than the actual virus itself, the RNA um, of the virus, it looks for pieces of the proteins that make up the virus. Um, again, looking for active, uh, active infection. Um, and these type of tests, the antigen tests can be laboratory-based and sometimes point of care, although both for PCR and antigen testing, the rule of thumb pretty much at this point is most of these types of tests are laboratory-based tests. Um, there are some tests that you'll hear near patient care. Um, so what that means, I think Abbott has one called the ID Now. It's a small instrument um, that will run um, kind of in, could be near the bedside um, or in an occupational health clinic. Um, and you'll typically get a result in about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so it's a little bit different than a laboratory-based test, but not quite as quick as some of the point-of-care rapid tests we might be used to on the drug testing side that give you a result in two, three, four, five minutes, um, something like that. Um, so then we, we go from kind of your active uh, infection, how you test for, for that, to antibody testing. Um, antibody testing is also called serology testing, and that determines if a donor has had a past infection. So it's not looking for active infection, are you sick today? It's looking for have you been exposed? Um, and those are really looking for antibodies. Um, and so those um, antibodies are actually they come out once somebody has been infected. Um, and these tests can be either point of care or laboratory based. Um, in fact, when you think about point of care testing, the majority of point of care tests that are out there for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 are antibody tests. Um, and there are also some laboratory based tests as well. Um, and then the next section here says both. So there, in some circumstances, there are some tests that actually look for both the antibody and the antigen. So kind of active virus as well as <clears throat> past, uh, past virus with the antibodies. Um, and those are at this point in time, primarily lab based. There are very few of these tests. Um, by far and away, the majority of tests that are on the market today are either viral PCR or antigen tests or antibody test, not a combination test. Um, but there are some manufacturers uh, and drug developers that are actually looking to bring some of these new tests to the market um, that would look for both antibody and antigen or uh, perhaps even PCR or antibody. Um, and those at this point in time would primarily be laboratory based. Um, there are also circumstances where people are combining two different tests in, at, at the same time. Um, so they're actually looking for doing PCR testing and uh, in, uh, the antibody testing. Um, it would be two different, two different samples, two different tests that are being taken. Uh, so not one test on the same platform, but two different tests. Um, and so that seems to be gaining some acceptance um, you know, recently um, because people are looking for both active as well as past infection. So next we're gonna look at, um, this, this chart is a really interesting chart because it talks about you know, when is the right time to test and what would you test for? Um, so if you look at the chart and you'll see there's a, a number of lines going through the chart, just to orient yourself with the chart, um, you're essentially looking on the bottom, it's, it's time, right? So the, the end point here at the very left side is the time of infection. Um, and then you're going out a number of days. So we count out seven days after infection, 14 days after infection, and about 21 days after infection. Um, and you'll see a number of lines here that talk about viral RNA, viral antigen, and then antibodies, both IgM and IgG. And so what happens when you're first infected, again, you know, when you think about PCR testing, that's actually looking at your RNA, um, and that shows up first. So in, in some people, 
um, the virus is going to show up very quickly within a matter of a couple of days. Um, and in other people, it may take a little bit longer. And so that's why you see it's kind of a, a bell-shaped curve. Um, so what you're looking at is you're looking at doing PCR testing um, in the very beginning stages of when someone was, is someone is sick. And you'll notice as you look at that bell-shaped curve, by the time you get to about 14 days, it starts coming down. So it's really important to understand how how far along someone is within their infection as to what you're gonna test them with. So if you start with a PCR test, um, if it's too early, you may not, somebody actually may not have active virus. So they may actually have a PCR test that comes out negative when in fact they are infected. And that's why sometimes you'll hear people talk about uh, the fact that, oh, wow, I, you know, I think I got reinfected. Um, it could very well be that just their body alone um, did not actually show the RNA right away when, when the test was done. And if they had waited a few more days, uh, they would have picked up a positive test. Um, also very similar, and many of you are aware of, of drug testing, very similar to what we call cutoffs in drug testing, where you set a specific cutoff. Um, with any laboratory-based test or any point of care test, there's always there that, that cutoff level that says, where is my positive and where is my negative? So it could also be that that particular test cutoff level, that person may have been positive, but not positive enough to trigger a positive result. Um, Antigen tests, and you'll see that's kind of that's the red line here, they start a few days later. Again, because you're not looking at the actual RNA, you're looking for pieces of the virus. Um, so it typically starts within about three or four days of someone being infected. Um, but you can really start to pick up viral antigen probably at about the seven, seven to eight day mark. Um, and then you'll also see a very similar drop off as you did with the viral RNA at about the time that both the viral tests drop off, you'll actually start to see antibodies increasing. And so you see here, um, there's IgM and IgG antibodies. So IgM antibodies actually stand for immunoglobulin, and that's the IgM. Um, and then IgG um, is another form of Im immunoglobulin, um, and that's I it's called IgG. Um, some of you may be aware, also with drug testing, if you're looking for specimen validity testing, we also call that an IgG test. Um, so it's amazing how many differences, or I'm sorry, similarities there are in, in some of the, the drug tests that we normally see into other tests like infectious disease testing. Um, so you're looking for IgM and IgG, and one of the things that you would want to be concerned about if you're thinking about an antibody test as, is what that antibody test is actually looking for. Um, is it looking for what we call total antibody, and that includes IgM and IgG antibodies, or is it looking for something more specific? Um, in this particular case, there are specific tests for IgG antibodies. There are also specific tests for IgM antibodies. So as you're thinking about, you know, possibly looking at antibody testing, something you want to be thinking about is what do I want to detect? Do I want to detect you know, almost like a class? You know, when we think about opiate drug testing, we think about the class of opiates. You're kind of thinking about it in the same way here. Do you want do you want a broad class that says I'm looking for any antibodies, and that would be IgG and IgM, um, or do you want to be very specific and only look for the IgG or the IgM? Um, and that'll tell you what kind of test. Um, so the next slide is going to talk about when you're thinking about testing, when, you, when would you want to test? Now let's talk about active virus here. And so this is going to be viral testing. So this will be either your PCR or your antigen type of test. Um, so you're in the workplace and you suspect that there's a, a possible case of COVID-19. Um, should you test for it or should you not test for it? Um, so one of the things that you really want to consider, a couple of things you want to consider, um, is do you have a reason to believe that you or um, someone that you're working with has been exposed? Um, exposure, obviously, as we all know, we're being asked to wear masks to cut down on exposure, uh, social distancing to cut down on exposure. Um, if you feel that someone around you has been exposed either directly or indirectly, that would be a good reason to think about, I should get a test. Um, additionally, if you're experiencing any signs or symptoms, and in a couple of slides, we'll talk a little bit about what those signs and symptoms are. 
Um, but if you're experiencing a fever, um, typically of at least 100 or greater, um, or you've got a cough, difficulty breathing, um, some of the other classic signs and symptoms of, of COVID-19, that would be another reason to test. Um, so again, here we say if yes to any of the above, testing might be necessary. Um, and one of the things you might want to think about is if you're in a workplace situation and you've got an employee that's exhibiting, exhibiting symptoms, it may not just be that employee that you want to have tested. You may want to have uh, anyone that that employee would have come in contact with um, over that period, you know, a short period of time to consider getting a test. So when would you not test for a viral, um, viral uh, when would you not have a viral test? If you've got an individual that has mild symptoms or doesn't have any of the underlying medical conditions, um, in a few slides when we go through the chart of symptoms, we also included symptoms for the common cold, for flu, for seasonal allergies, and you'll see that many of the symptoms for COVID-19 are exactly the same symptoms for your typical colds and flus and, and allergies and things like that. So um, if that's one consideration you might wanna think about is, you know, self-isolation at that point may be the better course of action. Um, have that person isolate, see what happens uh, as far as if their symptoms progress and then proceed to a test. So the next slide, um, we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of viral and antibody testing. Um, so when you think about, you know, there's lots of pros and cons um, to any kind of method that you might be thinking about. Um, obviously, the, the biggest pro to viral testing is you can detect the virus before the individual has some, some symptoms. Um, maybe not in all cases, um, but most cases people are going to start um, actually shedding virus before they start feeling really bad. Um, and so that could be a very good reason to, to start testing people. Um, they're easy and quick to administer. Um, and instant results are possible, although, as I said before, the majority are, are laboratory-based. Um, one other thing to, to consider when you're thinking about antigen testing, and again, this is there's a difference between PCR and antigen. Um, PCR testing typically is more expensive than antigen testing. Um, PCR, the way you need to do a PCR test is very, um, very complex. Um, think about it in the drug testing world, like doing a, a regular screening test and then doing a confirmation test. We all know that confirmation testing um, takes different instrumentation. Um, it takes longer to do. It's more comprehensive um, and it's more complex. And that's kind of how you should think about PCR testing. Antigen testing is very similar to a drug screen that you're used to, a typical laboratory test or even a typical clinical chemistry test. Um, very easy. You kind of just put it on the instrument and the instrument runs and there's not a whole lot of interaction and because of that it's actually less expensive to run an antigen test than it would be a PCR test. So that's another pro for uh, viral testing from an antigen perspective. Um, a couple of the cons, um, remember we, we talked about you know the, this type of viral testing is really looking for active infection so it doesn't really determine if somebody has had a past infection. That's really what antibody testing is for. Um, and then you'll see in a couple of minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about how you'd collect. The majority of ways that you do viral testing can be pretty intensive from a uh, personal protective equipment. Um, when you think about nasal swabs and things like that, um, because you're very close to that person, uh, PPE is really going to be needed, face shields and gloves and, and things like that. Um, another couple of cons, um, because you're talking about um, nasal, the, the nasal pharyngeal swabs, and hopefully none of you have had the, the distinct pleasure of having to have one of those, um, but if, if you have, um, you know that it goes pretty far up the nasal cavity, and it's uncomfortable. Um, and if you don't have an adequate sampling technique, um, if the person, you know, kind of squirms in their seat because it's uncomfortable um, or you don't get far up enough the nasal cavity, um, you could take an inadequate sample and that could lead to a false result as well. 
Um, and also because viral loading and shedding can decrease with time. Remember that, that bell curve I was talking about um, a few minutes ago. If you're getting somebody on the downside of that bell curve, perhaps there's not enough virus, active virus left to actually um, have a positive result. So again, when in the infection that you're testing is extremely important because you may miss that window and that person who really is positive may not show up as positive on the test. So some pros for antibody testing. Um, obviously it determines if you've had COVID-19 um, even without realizing that you did. Um, I think we're, we're all pretty well aware that there's a lot of uh, asymptomatic people that are out there that are uh, kind of walking around with very, you know, they, they could be mild symptoms or perhaps um, they don't even know that they have the virus um, or have had the virus. So an antibody test is a really good way to know, you know, I felt sick a couple of weeks ago, but I wasn't really sure if it was COVID or a flu. Um, antibody tests will tell you for sure. Um, it really gives a true um, impact and analysis of, of COVID-19. Um, it can help determine when the illness has occurred so that we can know, and we know that because we, we can track back with IgM and IgG kind of when that would have happened. Um, you know, I, I think, again, I think a couple of weeks ago I might have been sick or maybe it was a month ago. You, you can kind of pinpoint, um, you know, what that impact was. Um, it aids in the treatment of those with COVID-19. Um, and and what, that, what I mean by that is, um, it can help who determines to uh, donate plasma. Um, so you probably heard that one of the treatments that we're looking at is donating convalescent plasma to those who are actively sick. So if you've got the antibodies, that those antibodies can be used in that plasma to help people get better. Um, some of you may remember, um, I think it was back in 2016 when we had the Ebola scare. Um, there were a couple of um, people that were treated with convalescent plasma from those who had actually gotten, um, who had recovered from Ebola. So it is a, a good method. Um, also, if, if a number of people um, in a community take the test, it can help public health leaders and researchers know what percent of the population has already had the virus. And that's really important when we start looking at prevalence rates. Um, I know we're not going to go into a lot of detail here around accuracy, um, but you may hear, hear terms like um, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, PPV, NPV, or uh, what they're, uh, they're short for. Um, and those things, your sensitivity, specificity, how well the tests work, in many cases also depends on how many people within the population have already been exposed and sick. Um, so it's a good way to, to know that. Um, also potentially could help with vaccine development. You know, we're, we're every day, I think we hear something in the news about another clinical trial that's, trial that's starting and vaccines that are being developed. Um, you can't have vaccines without people that have antibodies. So antibody testing is really important for that. Um, and another pro is there are both lab-based and point of care options available. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, from a con perspective, could develop a false sense of immunity. Um, you know, if what if the test was incorrect and you think you're walking around and you've been immune and now you not only expose yourself, but perhaps other people. Um, and it doesn't rule out that there could be a chance of active infection. And, and the reason I say that, if you remember the chart, that there's still some viral um, antigen that could be happening at the same time those IgM and IgG levels are coming up. So there's a possibility there could be some overlap. Okay, um, so when we think about sample testing methodologies um, for, you know, what kind of specimens, how are we collecting specimens? So I mentioned nasopharyngeal a couple of minutes ago. Um, so that's the swab to the nasal cavity. Um, and, and that's the one that everybody kind of is talking about um, when you go to the, you know, the drive through lines or you suspect that you've got COVID. Um, typically what they're going to do is they're going to do, for the most part, those, they're going to start with a PCR test. And the best way to get that, that viral RNA is to actually swab the nasal cavity. Um, and, and really, you know, to correctly perform, the, the patient's got to be seated comfortably. They, they kind of put their head back. The swab is inserted in the nose horizontally. Um, and it goes in for quite some time. You'll see there on the slide until resistance is met. Um, and I kind of, if anyone's ever seen the movie Total Recall, 
this is I'm dating myself, but when Arnold Schwarzenegger had the tracker that was implanted, they went all the way up to his nose to take it out. It's kind of like what a what a nasopharyngeal swab is like. Maybe not as extreme as that, but it's certainly not pleasant. Um, there are there's also uh, just a regular nasal swab. Um, so this is a lot less intense. Uh, so it goes into the nose uh, and it's less, typically less than one inch. It's about a half, somewhere between a half an inch to an inch into the nostril. Um, and this, the nasal uh, test can be done for PCR, but more often than not, it's done for the antigen side. So again, the, the viral side of things, that would be the antigen. Um, you can also swab the back of the throat and that's called oral pharyngeal. Sometimes you'll see that, um, um, simplified as OP. Um, and I should mention sometimes nasal pharyngeal is abbreviated as NP. So if you ever see NP, that means nasal pharyngeal. And if you see OP, that means oral pharyngeal um, or throat swab. Um, and this can be used for PCR testing, um, sometimes also antigen, but primarily for PCR testing. And then you'll also see oral fluid. So swab to the cheek, um, or you can spit. Um, and so while the majority of testing that's done for PCR and antigen at this point in time is done with either the, the nose throbs the, or the, um, the nasal swabs or throat swabs, um, there are some tests out there that are using oral fluid. Um, so a couple of months ago, you might have seen uh, the Rutgers actually came out with a um, saliva-based test where you actually spit into a tube. Um, so those are being looked at as well. And similar to drug testing, um, it's kind of a, a new and up, and up and coming way for people to look at some diagnostic applications um, from the oral fluid or the saliva. Um, so that can either be a spit in the tube um, or it could be a swab that's just placed in the cheek after perhaps rubbing against the gums, the, the gum line. Um, saliva testing can be used for either uh, the, the PCR or antigen, uh, so your active virus. It can also be used uh, or will be used hopefully in the future for antibody testing. Um, that's, a, that's kind of a, a new and up and coming methodology for antibody testing. Um, and then blood testing, primarily used for, for antibody testing, uh, that's a finger prick or a blood draw. Um, finger prick is just a very simple, just like you were taking a hemoglobin test or for diabetes or something like that, um, just a very simple finger prick and then uh, it goes on in most cases to a rapid point of care strip. Um, again, very similar to what your folks are used to for, for drug testing. So when we look at some of the pros and cons of testing specimens, um, when you think about uh, nasal pharyngeal, nasal or throat, we kind of lump them all in the same, the same place as far as the, the pros and the cons, um, because they're very much similar. Um, so they're highly accurate um, for specimen, specimens for detecting purposes. Um, also readily available. Now I do say that, I say readily available with a grain of salt because as you may recall, when we first started testing uh, back in the March and April timeframes, it was very difficult to get the swabs or the viral medium um, to actually put the swabs in to send to the labs. Now that has changed. Um, so we've got a lot more uh, availability for all of the, the, the different tests that are out there. Um, but as we are now ramping up and seeing more and more people um, testing positive and having believe that they have COVID, we're starting to have some issues with supply again. Uh, again. So um, I, again, take that readily available with, the, with a grain of salt. But for the most part, these types of uh, sample um, collection devices are, are pretty easy to get. Some of the cons, um, you can imagine a little bit of discomfort there. Um, they are collector driven, which requires close contact. Um, in, in some cases, they're invasive. Um, a, a, a professional technician um, needs to be used for, for the most cases for all of these. Um, and so when you think about, um, you know, in our, our COVID world of maintaining a safe distance and, um, you know, trying not to get too close to people, um, it's a little bit difficult with some of these uh, some of these models. Now, one thing we have not talked about is, is self collection, um, and some of the tests that do actually include a nasal swab, as an example, or perhaps a, sw a, a throat swab, um, are being done now from a self collect perspective. 
Um, so I think we're starting to see a little bit more of that, and, and that will be a really good thing um, if more of these type of tests come out um, so that we don't have to rely on other people administering the test for us. Um, but that nasal pharyngeal, which again is really the, the main primary way that PCR testing is done, um, I think it's going to be really difficult to make that a self-test. So those tests are always going to be administered by someone, or I should say for the most part, um, administered by someone. Then you look at oral fluid. So same thing we talk about on the, the drug testing side. Um, it's, it's quick and easy to administer. Um, whether you're spitting or you're collecting uh, with a swab, it's usually just a couple of minutes uh, from a collection perspective. Um, it's non-invasive. The person does it themselves. Um, it's a donor-driven process. Um, and the accuracy is comparable. The studies that we've seen, um, the, the Rutgers product and, and others out there, show that it's comparable to nasal pharyngeal. Um, so the science seems to be there, which is great. Um, one of the, the downsides, though, is it's not widely available. Um, and what I mean by that is there's just not a lot of tests out there currently for saliva. Um, once those tests become available, then I think manufacturers will have them readily available. Um, but right now, you know, it's, it's a, it, there are just not that many products out there that use saliva. Um, and then blood, also very highly accurate, um, just as we see with drug testing and many other clinical chemistry tests, blood is very, very stable. It's, it's a good way to test, also readily available. Um, but again, some of the same cons that you see with the nasal pharyngeal, uh, nasal and throat, uh, needs to be performed by a trained professional, um, close contact, and somewhat invasive. Um, again, I think it'll be interesting as we think about self-collect options. Um, is, is, is a blood test something that will become self-collect? Um, and hopefully the answer is yes, and that will make it a lot easier. We do know today that a lot of the point-of-care antibody tests that are out there are um, being used from a self-collect perspective. Um, so hopefully that bodes well for the future. So signs and symptoms, uh, no, I'm sorry, best practices. Uh, I, we're, we're almost getting to the signs and symptoms here, but with best practices, um, we wanna talk a little bit about just in general, um, you know, and we talked a little bit just a few minutes ago about donor-driven collection methods, um, specifically really looking for, for oral fluid, uh, perhaps some of the, the other methods could lend themselves towards donor-driven, especially if we get to a self-collect for our self-test and self-collect. Um, claim um, when possible, especially where you know we are with social distancing, it would be great to be able to use a donor donor driven collection method. Um, certainly, use of recommended PPE, um, you know, masks, respirators, uh, when you can, face shields. Um, you know, conduct screening if you're going to be doing testing. Uh, you want to conduct that screening at the beginning of each day. Um, one of the things you want to be thinking about um, is if if people are entering and exiting the building, um, you know, do you want to test them again? Um, when possible, if you can collect, if you can conduct the screening outside of the workplace or virtually, um, you know, we're all on so many, you know, whether it's Zoom or go to meeting, whatever it is, we've, uh, many of us have had to conduct our business in a very different light over the past couple of months. Um, and you see, you know, physicians uh, are also doing the same. So doing things virtually when, when you can. Um, if you are going to be testing, um, you know, from an employer perspective, what, what are things that you can be doing? Um, so you can um, take body temperature. Um, and I think that is something, you know, as we mentioned before, you're looking for a temperature that's elevated, 100, usually 100.4 or higher. Um, and I think this is, you know, body, body temperatures um, being taken are becoming even more prevalent. You know, you, you go to the gym, you get your temperature taken. Um, so that, that's not something, you know, that's out of the realm of possibility. Um, employers can require their employees that have symptoms to stay home. Um, obviously, you don't want to spread those if you can avoid it. Um, you can require employees returning to work to provide a doctor's note uh, certifying that you are negative. Um, I believe when, when you think about coming back um, kind of into society or back to work, you have to have two negative PCR tests before you're allowed to come back. Um, you can question applicants for the symptoms and you can admire a you can administer a, a viral test to check for active infection. 
Um, some of the things you can't necessarily do or not, you may not require, you can't require an antibody test prior to admitting employees back to work. Um, I think many of us had heard back you know, a couple of months ago, we might have to have what they called immunity passports um, before we'd be allowed to come back to work. And the simple fact is right now, we don't know exactly what immunity means. Um, so those are not being, um, a, a those are not a requirement to be able to come back to work. Um, and you can't really postpone a start date or withdraw a job offer because an individual is at a higher risk for, for COVID. Um, so a couple of things just to keep in mind. When we think about signs and, signs and symptoms, and I know this is an eye chart, um, but you'll have access to this, um, you know, when if you wanted to go back and, and re-listen to the the, uh, the webinar. Um, typically, your signs and symptoms usually with, appear within a few days, as I mentioned before, um, two to two to 14 days. Um, and from that point in time, you know, these are some of the, the common signs and symptoms. The most common, um, cough, shortness of breath, um, and at least two of the following, fever, chills, um, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat. Um, and now I think we know that we've seen some newer ones come on, which is the loss of taste or smell. Um, and keep in, keep in mind, as, as I mentioned these, fever, chills, uh, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, how similar are those to the common cold or the flu? Um, and that's why, you know, sometimes at the very onset, you're not really sure exactly what you have or you don't have. Um, and that's why kind of checking to see that the cough and shortness of breath tend to be the, those are the, the two that really stand out. Um, so the last slide that I have really goes over, um, there were a couple of questions that we had, um, and I want to take these real quick uh, so that we can get to Bill's slides. Um, would a saliva test, saliva point of care COVID test be feasible? Um, and I think we, we kind of talked about that, answered that question. Um, it, feasible in development, yes. Um, while we don't see them very much uh, prevalent right now, uh, they will be coming out at some point in time. Uh, we hear every day in the news about universities that are trying to work on new saliva tests. I think people do realize that saliva is a really great non-invasive um, way to test. Um, so they, they will be coming out. Um, how is COVID-19 testing performed? Um, I think we talked about this as well. Um, so there's, you know, um, the, you've got the collection that you can do and send to a laboratory, or you can do point of care testing, um, in which case you take the sample right then and there, uh, you run it, and then you'll have the results within a few minutes. Uh, within a few minutes. And then lastly, what are the options for collecting and testing for the live virus versus antibodies? Again, I think we we did go through that quite a bit. So live virus, you're looking for PCR and uh, antigen testing and antibody. Um, you know, you're looking for the IgG and IgM. Um, there are, again, a number of products out there for antibody testing, many of them point of care. And I know Bill's going to get into this in a little bit, but one of the things you really want to be cognizant of is the performance and FDA. Um, I think we've all seen over the past couple of months that there are a number of these point of care products that came in uh, that didn't have very good performance. Um, so you really want to do your homework when you're looking at that. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Jackie. And I did a COVID workplace COVID testing webinar maybe six weeks ago or eight weeks ago. And one of the things, one of the points I made was that, you know, this is also new to all of us and things are changing constantly. And I said at the time, you know, three, four months ago, there were really no experts when it came to COVID-19 testing. Uh, but I think uh, you can tell from Jackie's portion of the presentation, she really knows what she's talking about. That was one of the best explanations. Um, I've sat in on a lot of COVID tests and our webinars and, and read a lot of articles. That was really great. One of the best explanations of the methodology, the collection processes, the specimens, what to look for. And one of the things that we do at the current consulting group is every year, as some of you on the webinar know, we conduct an, an annual survey of the drug testing industry. And this year, um, Orisher co-sponsored a survey on COVID testing in the workplace or the COVID-19 in the workplace. And so we asked a lot of questions and we're gonna do, be doing a webinar on August 18th 
um, <clears throat> which uh, Orisha will be hosting on the results of the survey. We're pulling all of that together now, excuse me, and putting together an executive summary. But one of the questions we asked was, you know, what, what are the obstacles to having a COVID-19 workplace policy or, or conducting COVID-19 testing? And it was interesting because about a quarter of the respondents said creating a COVID-19 testing policy is their biggest obstacle. And 23% said, they just didn't know enough about it. And 16% said they just didn't know where to start. And so typical of companies that are trying to launch a drug testing program that have never done it before, they just need help getting started. And so we're gonna talk about a few basic things here that are really important to understand as you contemplate you know, reopening your workplace or helping your clients reopen their workplaces and addressing the whole COVID-19 pandemic and what their post-pandemic, hopefully we'll get to a post-pandemic era at some point, what a post-pandemic workplace would look like vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 testing. So we're gonna look at three different questions. Is it legal, is it accurate, and is it practical? So first off, is COVID-19 testing legal? And the answer is yes, in all 50 states. There are no states that have outlawed or prohibited or put out some type of ban on COVID testing. Now, we know this, and Jackie made this very clear, that not all testing methods are permitted under every situation, nor are they an ideal match for every testing situation. So you go back to some of the slides that Jackie just shared with us, and you match the testing method with the situation to make sure that you're getting the right return on your investment for that particular testing method in that particular situation. The best advice, check state reopen guidelines. Look at the, the CDC website, the EEOC websites, because those are great sources. You're gonna find terrific information and they're always being updated. They're regularly being updated. So go to the CDC and the EEOC websites, but make sure you're looking at the reopen guidelines for the state or states where you do business. Here at CCG, at Current Consulting Group, we've collected all of those reopen guidelines. Every single state has issued reopen guidelines, and many of those reopen guideline documents have specific guidance for COVID, workplace COVID-19 procedures, protocols, best practices, and in some cases, testing. So look at those reopen guidelines. That will help you a great deal. Is it accurate? Well, of course, we just heard from Jackie that it is accurate, but not all testing products are created equal. And not all testing methods produce the same kinds of results. We know that, and Jackie articulated that perfectly. So whether you're looking for testing, a methodology testing for active infections versus past infections or the presence of antibodies that may give the indication of a past infection, the different testing methods produce different results and give you different kinds of information. Best advice, and this again is repeating something Jackie just said, is look for a, a device or a testing system that is either FDA cleared or has an FDA issued emergency use authorization. EUA become a very common um, acronym that has been around for a long time, but we're all aware of it now, right? Because we're seeing EUA in a lot of write-ups and reports and articles on different types of COVID-19 testing, products, devices, methods, et cetera. Best advice, just like when it comes to drug testing, you're looking for an FDA cleared testing system, whether it's a collection device in, in, or the actual laboratory testing that's gonna take place, or an FDA issued emergency use authorization, okay? Keep in mind as well that there are differences, just like with drug testing, there are significant differences between lab-based and POC testing devices. It's not to say one is better than the other in all circumstances, but just be aware that it's not always apples to apples. Sometimes it's apples to pears or apples to oranges, but there are differences between lab-based and POC testing, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're looking at those very carefully and look for a device's product insert, okay? The device's sensitivity level, it's a, it's, capacity to produce a true positive and its specificity level, its capacity to, pr to produce a true negative. That's very important. And that information will typically be found 
in the product insert that comes with your testing device. So look for that. Be aware that the FDA minimum requirement is 95% specificity and 90% sensitivity. So if you're looking at that product insert and you're looking specifically at its sensitivity level and its and specificity level, those are the minimum requirements that you wanna look for. Now, just like with drug testing, you're gonna have a policy statement. Absolutely, definitely make sure you have a policy statement before you start conducting workplace COVID testing. Again, you can find some great guidance on that at the EEOC website, at the CDC website, and very specifically, can't stress this enough, at your particular state's reopen guidelines. But your policy is typically gonna cover four main areas. How you're gonna conduct COVID testing, when you're gonna test, who's gonna be subject to testing, and how often you'll conduct testing. So I won't repeat all the information about viral versus antibody and the different testing methods, but that's gotta be explained in your written policy. And when to test, there's lots of different circumstances, right? Again, you'll find guidance on this at the EEOC website. For example, the EEOC website specifically states that pre-employment COVID testing is permitted as long as it's not discriminatory in any way. So in other words, if you're going to conduct pre-employment COVID testing, which is a good idea, make sure that every applicant is subject to pre-employment COVID testing and not just certain ones. You can't make it sort of a reasonable suspicion pre-employment COVID test. You can, under some circumstances, conduct pre-random. Uh, Pre-duty would be testing people before they come to, uh, before they gain access to the workplace, and very importantly, return to work. Now, in the drug testing world, a return to work test is when somebody's coming back to work, having uh, been on a leave of absence to take care of a substance abuse problem. In this case, it's somebody coming back to work after being at home, being in self-quarantine, and making sure that they're coming back to work and being tested to make sure that they're negative before they come back in. Remember, Jackie talked about getting some type of written note or um, uh, report from the doctor to show that you've had at least two te uh, negative test results. Who test? Again, all applicants or no applicants, but you can't be discriminatory. And if you're gonna do, say, pre-duty testing, it's got to be applicable to everybody in the workplace. And how often you test will depend on why you're testing, under what circumstances, right? So if you've got a lot of people who are out on some type of COVID leave of absence, then at some point you're gonna be testing those people when they come back. And the volume of testing could fluctuate depending on various circumstances. The EEOC has declared that COVID-19 is a direct threat to the workplace. And so certain things are allowed that maybe under other circumstances wouldn't be allowed. For example, for, for example, temperature checks are permitted, like Jackie talked about. COVID testing itself is permitted. It would typically uh, be considered a medical exam, and there would be certain, or uh, yeah, and there would be certain restrictions on that. But because the EEOC has declared it a direct threat to the workplace, there is some latitude there. Very importantly, though, make sure that you check those EEOC website updates on a regular basis because they could at some point change uh, the status of COVID testing. I don't see that happening anytime in the near future, but possibly it could happen you know, at some point and you're gonna wanna make sure that you're up to date on that. There's a lot of guidance from the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on the CDC website. I'll just quote this one statement. All employers need to consider how best to decrease the spread of COVID-19 and lower the impact in your workplace. This should include activities to prevent and reduce transmission among employees, maintain healthy business operations, and maintain a healthy work environment. And so some common sense things, right? Like, like washing your hands on a regular basis, encouraging sick individuals to stay home and not come back until they're feeling better. Just taking, not taking anything for granted, really. Make sure that you're you're encouraging individuals to, to cover their coughs and their sneezes, to use tissues and have trash cans available where they can deposit those tissues so they're not laying around on someone's desk or in their work area. And make sure that to the extent possible, you're practicing safe physical distancing, social distancing in the workplace, and discourage people from swapping tools and other things that 
they might otherwise share one with another so that we're not taking any chances in those regards. And then keep your workplace clean. Make sure that in every possible way, you're sanitizing the workplace on a regular basis so that you can show as an employer, you're making a good faith effort to make sure that your workplace is safe, clean, and healthy for everybody that's involved with it. We have a bunch of other slides here that, that are just you know great information. You're gonna have access to all of this. Let me get to a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time, and then we'll go to questions that have been submitted during the webinar. Do I need to add COVID testing to my workplace policy? Well, that's an interesting way to phrase that question. You need to have a COVID testing policy, but just keep in mind that state drug testing laws do not apply to COVID-19 testing. So you need a COVID testing policy that is a standalone policy that addresses all the issues that I just discussed. It's not simply an addendum to an existing drug testing policy, because that's a separate issue with separate laws. It seems like it overlaps. It's a, a, a smart thing to do, but you need to treat it separately. What are the current best practices return, for returning to work? We discussed a lot of that already in this presentation, but I will just say that it would be probably irresponsible for an employer to reopen the business and not have the CDC guidelines in place, like this, the social distancing, covering, uh, facial coverings, things of that nature, making sure that the workplace is sanitized. But for the individual, you wanna make sure that, I think that you're taking their temperature every day as they come into the workplace, that anybody who is showing the signs or symptoms has an opportunity to freely admit that so that they're not necessarily in risk of losing their job, but they're given the time to go home and self-quarantine. And then if possible, allowed to come back to work. Individuals who refuse to be tested, whether for a pre-employment test or some type of uh, a test of an incumbent employee, the, the EEOC allows the employer not to hire that individual or to terminate employment of an individual if they refuse to be part of a COVID testing program. But again, make sure you have a policy in place so that everything's written, it's there, it's, it's free for everybody to see, and then make sure that you've trained your supervisors and your employees in how to actually uh, implement and maintain the program on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have a few minutes left. Jackie, do we have any questions that have been submitted from our audience today? Are you there, Jackie? Yep, I, I apologize. Can, okay. can you say that again, Bill? Yeah, any questions uh, from our audience that uh, we haven't covered already? Uh, so I know Jessica was monitoring the questions. There was a comment that came uh, that was talking about uh, that the Gates Foundation provided some research that independently verified by the FDA that swabs from the front of the nose were as accurate as a deep sinus cavity swabs, so those NP swabs I was talking about. Um, and that's that's great news because as I mentioned, um, you know, those those deep nasal swabs are very, very um, uncomfortable for people. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things we're finding is as, um, you know, as the science is improving with some of these tests, uh, the collection methods are also improving. Um, so so that was very good to hear. So thank you for uh, the person that that sent that in. Um, Jessica, I don't think we have any other questions at this time, correct? Looks like that was the only question comment that we had. That is correct. However, if anyone who is on today's call would like to submit a question, now is a great time to do that. Um, you can use the question section to type us in your questions. And of course, if you don't have any questions right now, but as you review the recording, you have other questions. I know Bill and Jackie would be happy to address those questions offline. Yeah, and, and Jackie, let me just add at this point that, um, you know, we're gonna be doing the COVID-19 in the Workplace Survey webinar on August 18th. One of the things that we did with this particular survey is that we, we created two separate tracks. So at the very beginning of the survey, and we may have some people on the line today who participated in the survey, because we had hundreds of respondents. Um, at the beginning of the survey, you identify yourself either as an employer, not in the drug testing industry, or as someone who is a provider of drug testing services. And then it would take you down two different sets of, of questions. So it was like doing two surveys at the same time. So what we're gonna be doing on the 18th is we're gonna be presenting results from both the employer side of the survey 
and from the provider, I'll say, the provider side of the survey. So you'll get kind of a unique perspective on what employers are thinking versus what providers are thinking. And we ask questions along the lines of, um, you know, drug testing practices, of course. Um, how has the pandemic affected the type of testing that you do, the type of alcohol testing method that you utilize? Are you, um, you know, looking at alternative specimens like lab-based oral fluid testing? We saw a significant percentage that have either switched to or have added oral fluid testing to their um, testing program simply because it's been challenging for some employers to find traditional urine collection services. And another thing that we found very interesting, just to, to tease our audience a little bit for that, that survey that's coming, or that webinar in August, is that a growing percentage, and you kind of referred to this, Jackie, as we're making, um, you know, sort of altering the way that we do business, uh, uh, an interesting percentage of people indicated that they have been utilizing what's sometimes called telehealth collections. Uh, our remote video observed collections with some type of a, a video platform like Zoom or or um, or Proof, for example, that's one that's out there. So we're seeing a lot of companies doing what they have to do, uh, making whatever changes and alterations to their program to, to keep going. And of course, um, one of those things is the fact that they're looking at alternative testing specimens, not because there's anything wrong with urine testing, of course, but it's just challenging in some ways to get that done. And, you know, an interesting question for you, Jackie, as we come to the last few minutes here is, you know, what impact has, have you and your company seen as a result of the pandemic? And what does the future look like? What do you think? Uh, Bill, do you mean as far as drug testing or as far as COVID testing? Well, both of them, but, you know, sort of, we're dealing with the drug testing industry. So how have you seen the pandemic affect that vis-a-vis -vis drug testing and or COVID testing. Yeah, so I think, you know, most most everybody on the in the audience uh, today probably would not argue with this. We've we've certainly seen a, a decrease. Um, you know, we've got a lot less people working, therefore there's a lot less people that are being drug tested. Um, so I know that we've talked with a number of our lab partners, TPAs, um, and I think across the board, everyone has seen certainly, you know, quarter two uh, was was really, really down compared to quarter one. Um, and I think we had hopes that, um, you know, later this year, we would have seen the virus retreat a little bit um, and people come back to work. And so we would have thought that the this back half of the year would have would have improved. Um, but with everything going on in, you know, so many of the different states now, um, even a few are contemplating lockdown again. I, I heard uh, California is looking at lockdown and maybe some of the other states as well. Um, I, you know, I, I think quarter three will be a little bit better than quarter two and, and quarter four probably um, a little bit better than, than quarter three. But until we have a vaccine, I think it's um, I think we're all going to be kind of searching for new ways to, you know, to, to do things. Um, it just even the fact that the feds from a DOT perspective have kind of forgiven some of the drug testing um, that is re a requirement. Um, that's, you know, that's a big tell there. Um, and as far as COVID testing is concerned, um, you know, I, I think I think we're going to see COVID tests um, become more and more um, convenient and and kind of more to the point of care. I think the whole self uh, self collect um, is going to be kind of the next wave. Um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, we have been talking about a lot is um, there's so much testing that's going to be required, uh, whether it's for active or active infection or for antibody. Um, you talk about, you know, the, the kids going back to school. That's the, the the biggest thing. I mean, it was nursing homes and, and clearly we can't take our foot off the gas there. But, um, you know, we've got to figure out how we're going to get these kids back to school safely. Um, and what kind of testing is going to be done um, from from that perspective? So, um, I, I think you know the next wave is really going to be these you know rapid tests that are going to be able to detect active virus antigen testing. I, I think that's very well needed, and and I I know that there are a number of tests that are in development, um, and I think that's really going to help us as time goes on. Thank you. Great insights. And if people on today's webinar have questions, here's how you can get a hold of uh, Jackie and the and her uh, her 
is at Orisher Technologies. You can find more information at their website, or you can call 1-800-ORISHER or visit uh, or email them at chooseintercept at orisher.com. And I think that brings us to the end of today's presentation. I'll hand it back over to Jessica for any housekeeping items. Great, thank you so much, Bill and Jackie, of course. Um, what a wealth of information that was shared in today's presentation. On behalf of Orisher Technologies, we hope that you found today's presentation informative and helpful. If you have submitted a question that was not answered uh, during the live part of our presentation, we will have a representative reach out to you. This presentation was recorded and you will receive information on how to access the recording. We'd like to thank you for your attendance today and this concludes today's webinar. Have a great day.